Welcome back to Watching the Throne on the Late Night Chat Network, episode 63. All right. Welcome back, everybody. What's going on, Jay? What's going on, Eagle? Welcome back. Welcome back. And we're here once again for another episode in studio here. We got Jay here with me today as uh, we do another episode of Watching the Throne, episode 63. And we're just, uh, you know, we're just pumping these out, man. It's a lot of fun. And uh, thank you to everybody that's checked out the show thus far. And if you've missed an episode, you can always go back and check it out. Uh, them all in the playlist uh, here on the Late Night Chat Network, of course. And hopefully we get some more guests on before we end out the uh, show. Mm -hmm. And stay tuned because we plan on doing uh, directly after the airing of this uh, uh, Watching the Throw once we're done with this show. We're going to be doing uh, House of the Dragon Season 1. And we're going to try to time it if they can hopefully give us a date of when it's going to premiere soon. I think that we should time it hopefully like leading right into the premiere of the second season. We're going to try to air those episodes for you guys. And then that way, uh, as soon as season two starts of house of the dragon, we're going to actually be doing a week by week kind of like, uh, talk about that with people. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, because you know, we won't intense. actually, well, we won't have the same type of like scene by scene breakdown that we have that we're able to do with this show because it's the older, um, that we will with that show. So like, you know what I mean? Like that's, you know, I, for anybody who doesn't know, I kind of I pull these off the internet, these synopsises from like a dragon, a Game of Thrones uh, wiki, like Wikipedia, actually, that's online. And uh, because of the all the you know big fans of the show, there's people that actually have done the work and actually have gone through episode by episode and detailed synopsis for this. Any of these big TV, I mean, I've done the work. Come on, yeah, man. exactly. But any, <laughs> just it's, I don't think it'll look good on the page. I mean, any of these big shows though that have a big a big fan base, they do do this. You can find that kind of thing online. So that's yeah. for anybody that ever wonders. If like my English is as good as the way the things well, I read out on this show, it's not bad, but not as good as this is well, because I mean, I'm bro, <laughs> we can have mine on there. Mine starts off as you know, John and we just meeting the deers and the dwarf. That's there what I wrote. Go. I don't think so. so I, I, one proper. of these times, one of these episodes, we should have had you say scene by scene. I could go through it without me pulling this shit off the internet. So oh, we're gonna get canceled. But watch. <laughs> But or whatever. listen, no, it's okay. It's proper. They call him a dwarf on their show, right? We're only referring to what, what, what I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, for anybody wondering what the show is, this is our Game of Thrones kind of review overview kind of like show here where we we do episode by episode, scene by scene breakdown. And I'm revisiting the show for the first time ever after having watched it years ago when it finally first uh, aired. Mm -hmm. uh, never gone back and rewatched it. So this is kind of new for me in that sense as well. And JT's never seen the show before in these episodes that we talk about. So he kind of was, uh, became a fan through House of the Dragon, which is kind of weird to me just because uh, well, you did it backward. Well, technically you did it in right chronologically, yeah, in order, <laughs> like in terms of the timelines. Yeah, but like whatever. It's still... It, it just makes uh, not chronological, but like it just makes sense it, the way I well, don't. You know, you know what I mean. Like, there's people like you hear about like uh, certain guys that you actually know the names and you actually had seen see them first in the House of Dragons. The only reason I know some of these Targaryen names is because I seen the House of right. Dragons, right? I just think it's weird that you went that route with it, and I, I'm sure you're not alone. It's just I I feel like anybody who it helped catch my attention to be honest with you you know in that sense yeah yeah really did. i just think that majority of the people that would watch house of the dragon are game of thrones fans already right so like i don't know who that show uh, but i'm sure maybe some people checked out that show not knowing it was game of thrones for whatever reason and like you know ended up liking it and now i've, I've gone back and watched game of thrones right so anyways Today is uh, we're going to be talking about episode three of season seven of Game of Thrones, and it's called The Queen's Justice. And as I mentioned, it is the 63rd episode of Watching the Throne, our show here. Make sure you're subscribed and all that good stuff, guys. All right, Jay, what do you think of this episode? Another fucking interesting one. Yes, there are some big things that happened in this one, actually, which we're going to get to. Um, I, I be I, Compared to the last episode, I would say that 
Uh, I prefer this one a little bit personally, but like I was kind of sad by one of the deaths in this episode, uh, honestly, but I thought it was well done uh, despite, um, you know, it happening. Right. But what'd you, what'd you think about that? Yeah. yeah, It sucked, man. Yeah. (laughs) You know, but I like her her little wording afterwards. That's right. That that was interesting. We'll get into that. I mean, of course we're talking about the death of Olena Tyrell in this episode because like, you know, I think she's one of the most interesting characters that we have in the show right now, like still. And I love yeah. that character. We literally just finished talking about how much we loved her in the last episode. Um, and I just feel like whenever she's in a scene with anybody, no matter who it is, she does a great job. And I kind of see her get taken out in a great way, though, still, I thought. But like to get the humane way, I would think. Yeah, but to kind of. You know, I, I think it's the way that that character should have gone out, right? It's a good death, honestly, like in, in that regard, like because she still, as always, got to say her piece yeah. right at the end. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's very true to the character. I think they did right by um, the way that she got taken out on this show, to be honest, because like so many people, the way they go out is terrible, right? Brutal, like, yeah, yeah. So this was like, okay, yeah, this is like, the- we can't kill everybody's <laughs> grandmother that way, man. Like, fuck. Right, right. And I think, again, who the person that served up the death to her was, uh, you know, only right that he, he was the person that kind of, you know, did it in the fashion that he chose to do it in too. I thought was good of him. Right. Yeah. But anyways, we'll, we'll get to all that. <laughs> uh, but overall you liked this one. Would you say you liked this episode better, I guess, than the last one we well, talked yeah, you about? Get, you or... get people, people are meeting each other that, yes. you know, and they're starting to realize and more setup. Yeah, yeah. A lot more setup. Maybe, maybe right? we'll hear bend the knee a few times in this one too, as well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we do. <laughs> but, That's what I say. Yeah. All right. See how many times we can count it. This time. Yeah. So, anyways, we're uh, we're starting out here on Dragonstone. Speaking of bending the knee, here yeah. we go. All right. Uh, John and Davos arrive at Dragonstone in a in our one meet. day, one episode. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I told you. They're like, okay, we must travel the Dragonstone From the last north episode. To the, south. the start of this episode, they're yes. already there. The yeah. Farthest distance. Jay, but the shortest amount. We have of seven. Time. We got seven episodes this season to do this shit. In, okay, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm glad you're seeing this though. Like <laughs> that's the complaint. Yeah. This is literally see, the complaints of fans. Now, yeah. are you now? Are you agreeing with the complaints of uh, being a fan of this show? Now, I, mean, or I can understand why you guys complain. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, it, it you know, it's kind of weird because you take the, the size of the whole place, and it took them like fucking four fucking weeks to get to one little place close right beside king's landing right or the north and the south right now you're you're getting they go all the way from the north to south it's like they had airplanes or something (laughs) or buses i mean before it would be like a whole season's journey for them to do this right and and now it's just like all right uh, we're hey we need to get this done guys like for one scene to the next they're there right yeah Uh, anyways so they drive. They arrive at Dragonstone and are immediately greeted by Tyrion and Masande. Upon meeting, Tyrion addresses John as the bastard of Winterfell, while John addresses him as the dwarf of Casterly Rock. <laughs> the two share a friendly grin. John observes that Tyrion has picked up some scars. John also introduces Davos, while Tyrion introduces Masande, who requests that they surrender their weapons. John and his entourage hand over their weapons. Uh, to Daenerys's Dothraki guards, kind of not not wanting to at first, he kind of was like, eh, I don't know, and he's like, Okay, I trust this guy. Okay, I'll give you my weapon, right? Like, kind of weird. Yeah, he kind of had like a look there for a second. He's like, kind of uneasy about it, right? And then he looked at Tyrion, and he's just like, You know, he's like, Yeah, man, you know, you gotta give over your weapons, right? And he's like, All right, all right, here you go, right? He's like, Because uh, he thought he was walking into a a, a, a a situation there like where he get, yeah. get, get killed right i get it right yeah. no one else wanted him to go there but he's like i have to because i have no fucking choice we need these people's help in the coming uh war that's happening with the white walkers that no one believes in right yeah, <laughs> except no for one. them right so uh it's funny you say that jay because literally my first note on this scene was this trip took all of one episode <laughs> Well, I mean, really, we were just talking about it last episode, how quick scenes are jumping. So, I mean, to say that it only took one episode, you have to kind of point that out. Right? So, what is the distance? It's not a short distance. Right. So, on the walk to the castle, Masande walks with Davos and tells him that she comes from the island of Nath or Noth. Davos remarks that it was a paradise full of palm trees. 
John and Tyrion talk about Sansa Stark's marriage to Tyrion. Tyrion assures John that it was uh, sham and was never and it was never consummated, yeah. <laughs> and remarks that she is a lot smarter than she lets on. To which John agrees. This was funny. He was like, "Listen, uh, you know, it was it was unconsummated." He's like, "I didn't ask." Well, it was. I mean, it wasn't. Like he's like he's like, he's like well, it was. It was unconsummated. Yeah, yeah. Know, it was, he's like all tongue tied. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's like he's a little nervous. And then John's like, "Listen, I didn't ask. Like, don't tell me about this." He's just like, right. oh, I mean, didn't, he, didn't she already kind of say it to him? Yes. She kind of hit yes. It off to him but like it's that. just he's funny. He's guy. like, "I don't need to hear it from you." Like, yeah, you, know, you don't have to remind. He's me. like, "Yes, that that marriage was all a sham." He's like, "Don't worry about it. It was unconsummated. Believe me. Like, <laughs> we never had sex." He's like, "I don't want to listen to this." Right? Yeah. He's like, "Well, it was." Well, no, I mean, it wasn't, right? <laughs> like, it wasn't. He was trying to say it was, wasn't, yeah. uh, you know, they didn't have sex. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh, Tyrion assures John that it was a sham. It was never consummated and remarks that he's, she's a lot smarter and he agrees. Uh, then she lets on. While John is aware about the fate of the previous Starks who had met with the Mad King, John insists that he is not a Stark. John and Davos are startled at the sight of Drogon and Viserion flying low over the causeway and That's dive crazy. to the ground while an unmused Missandei and Tyrion retain their composure. Of course, yeah, this is the first time that they've seen the she existence dragons. of dragons. Yeah, that's right. right? It's always so. written down. Yeah, she's got dragons, but nobody's ever seen them. I like what he said here, too. Offering John a, a hand, a heads up there. He's like, Tyrion says he wishes he could tell John he'll get used to the dragons, but no one is quite used to them except for their mother, who is waiting for John within. I also liked his line about how Stark men don't really fare well when they go south. Right? <laughs> he mentions, like, yeah, well, I understand your reluctance to be here. Stark men really haven't had great luck coming here. That's why he's like, I'm a bastard, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm a snow, so don't, yeah. don't worry. Leave me alone. I, after so much time not being together, these two, it feels like they've always known each other. I can, they actually, the acting is really well done. I think between those two in this scene, because like, it's like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like a comfortable kind of like uh exchange between them where they're like, yeah, we trust well, each other. Two decent, half decent guys. Yes. I mean, John's decent. Of course. But I mean, he's Tyrion's the best of them, decent. right? Yeah. yeah. And Tyrion's, a, you know, he tries, right? He completes so, him maybe. Hold yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> In this next scene here, uh, on the cliffs overlooking the beach, Varys confronts Melisandre about her reluctance to see the king in the north. Melisandre responds to his prodding that she parted on bad terms with John and Davos because of terrible mistakes she made. And as we know, Davos said to her, when he last saw her, if he sees her again, he's going to kill her, right? <laughs> um, she says that now that she has brought ice and fire together, she will end her previous habit of whispering in the ears of kings and indicates her intention to travel to Volantis. When Varys suggests that she should not return to Westeros, Melisandre replies that she will return one last time as she is destined to die in Westeros, just like Varys. So did she just reveal something in this scene that's going to happen? Because but that's what I'm wondering. Where is she going to go? Is she going to really go back there to die? Like No, but she says that Varys is destined to die in Westeros. Now, is she just saying that in general because she knows that he belongs there and that is where he will die? Or is she saying because she knows magic and stuff that, and she can see things, you're going to die soon? She giving him a heads up, maybe. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't Jay. think, I didn't think I, that until you brought right? it up. Right? I don't know. Right? <laughs> I, I heard. I mean, I heard them say that, right? That they're gonna. That they're supposed to die there. She said they're supposed to die there, but I, well, I didn't. Think listen, together, like in two, in one regard, in one in one sense, it's something people say. Where they're like, "I'm from that town. Like, I'll die there." You know what I mean? And in yeah. another, that's kind of why I didn't. Really coming from the it. mouth of who it's coming from, is she? slightly trying to say like you're also destined to die there and is she giving us a hint of what's to come i don't know i guess we'll have to see i haven't i haven't seen anything yet so far so i guess we'll have to i'm not i'm not i'm not revealing anything by the way i'm just saying i'm just fucking with my head it's okay i I, I, I told you i didn't think anything of that i think it's i think it's interesting you didn't see it that way at all though that's interesting to me like you didn't you didn't see it at all that way i mean i've heard people say that they want to die that's right i know they want to be like buried in their home country or whatever but But it can look it can be looked at both ways what she said right so anyways she could be mind fucking him yeah in the throne room masande introduces Daenerys by her many titles well that was too funny bro (laughs) 
I didn't even write it down. I was like, I give up. Breaker of chains, blah blah blah, etc. One thousand, one thousand names later. Yeah. I love Davos. Is like this is Jon Snow. He's king in the north. <laughs> he's, like, he's, just like, up, the, he's just like this is Jon Snow, and he just like pauses. He's king in the north. That's it. I know. I love that. And he's just like, he just like looks at him. He's just like, like, it's like, like the doctor tags. Eh? Like, <laughs> Davo, like Masani is all like proper about it. Like, oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. She, the breaker of chains, the releaser of slaves or whatever, you know, yeah. like whatever. <laughs> the queen of dragons. Yeah. Uh, like, and then, then Davo's just like, uh, I don't know. He's the king. <laughs> what do you want of the North? What do you want? <laughs> It's the only thing I know, man. It's the king of the north. This is John, yeah. <laughs> I love that. That was great, yeah. So, um, <laughs> at John's awkward prompting, a slightly amused Davos introduces John simply as king in the north. Yeah. <laughs> Daenerys thanks John for traveling so far, but refers to him as a lord. Davos begs to differ, but Daenerys responds that there has been no king in the north ever since Tor and Stark bent the knee to Aegon the Conqueror and adds that an oath lasts per, for per, uh, perpetuity, which basically means forever, yeah. Uh, Daenerys then reiterates that her demand for Jon to bend the knee, but he refuses. There we go. Bending the knee, asking him to bend the knee, <laughs> asking him more than once in this scene, all right? <laughs> when, da when Daenerys accuses him of breaking faith with House Targaryen, John reminds her that the Mad King burnt his grandfather, Rickard Stark, and Uncle Brandon. Daenerys apologizes for her father's actions and stresses that children should not be punished for the crimes of their parents. She then urges John to renew the historic allegiance between their two great houses. John expresses agreement with Daenerys' view that the children should not be punished for the crimes of their parents, but argues that he is not beholden to his ancestors' oaths. John tells her that he has come because he needs her help and she needs his. Danny reminds him that she has three dragons and a Thraki who have pledged themselves to her. What do you think of this scene, Jay? This opening. I mean, they, they, they both had a decent point, in the sense that I mean, they both had a fair point in 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 uh, talking about you know what they said. You know that uh, he wasn't going to bend the knee and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. He just came for the help. But you, you know, at the end of the day, they he, she she's going to need the help with them too because they're going to come up. Who knows how far these White Walkers come up? Who knows so. I mean, I don't know. I I think it was a good a good opening between the yeah. two of them because they had to meet us somehow. Um, it made you laugh too when how yeah. the Davos part, right? They're but, kind yeah. of they're kind of like at a standstill here, though. Like you're right, you're right. They're both bringing up good points on whether or not like why they should fucking just give in to one another. You know what I mean? Like and 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 they both have coming from are coming from uh, unique but like similar situations in a way. You know what I mean? Where they, she's like, well, listen, like. I feel like I, I I'm owed this and this should be mine. And John's like, listen, I'm just trying to do right by my people, but she's also trying to do right by a lot of people as well. You know what I mean? Like, so it's, 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 it's interesting. Like, I think they can see eye to eye on a lot of things. These two, the more they kind of get into it. But I also think that Daenerys has a strong point that she shouldn't um, be punished for her father's actions. But why should John also give in to that? Just being like, I also was not around when this guy bent the knee how many fucking years ago, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. I think she's getting a little cocky already here in this scene. Like, she's already showing a new sense of cockiness here with the bending of the knee and everything else. Like, well, then you make that comment too. At least he's, she's a little bit, she's a little better than Cersei. Yeah, we're going to get to that here, but I did want to point this out because like, I will say this season and maybe even more next season, there's a lot of people that turned on their opinion of this character. I will just say that there's a lot of people that love this character that you're going to see that just did not like this character all of a sudden, maybe because all the bending of the knees stuff, but like, you're going to see, I think, uh, when you see her whole story arc, here's some people that I feel like did not love her by the end of this show. We'll see what happens, but it's interesting how a lot of people flip flopped in these last two seasons in terms of like people you loved, you hated people you hated, you loved by the end. It's very strange. Like there is a definite, uh, you know, change, I think in, in the, in the character arcs, I think in these last two seasons, as most shows go, right. Mm -hmm. sometimes they kind of stay the same throughout, and then other times people call out bullshit that like they feel like certain people are acting out of character all of a sudden, right? So uh we'll see. She seems I mean, yeah, she seems like she could be a little bit cockier. 
yeah in this one because maybe she's done a lot already and now she just you know wants what she wants mm -hmm. right so she's not willing to give but i don't know we'll see what happens Getting to the point of his trip, John likens the fighting between the great houses to children squabbling over a game. John points out that the army of the dead is her true enemy. Daenerys is skeptical, but Tyrion vouches for John. John says that they need to make cause to fight against the army of the dead. Daenerys asks if John knew if his father knew that his best friend had sent assassins to kill her as a baby, not knowing that Lord Eddard Stark had opposed King Robert Baratheon's assassination plot. Danny recounts that she was targeted by assassins, enslaved, raped, and defiled, but that her faith in herself, rather the gods, kept her going. Daenerys talks about the miracle of her dragons hatching and the Dothraki crossing the narrow sea. When Daenerys reiterates that she is destined to rule the Seven Kingdoms, Jon retorts that she will be ruling over a graveyard if the Night King is not defeated. Good fucking points, man. Like he, he's just like what it, it, everything you're fighting for is not going to exist if you don't fucking yeah, help yeah, me out. Nothing yeah, basically matters unless you do that. Right. Very good fucking point. Um, listen, Davos once again comes through with a clutch speech, yeah. right? As always, Davos is like clutch speech master, right? Like he always has some wise words to say in the moment. Well, he kind right? of fucked up here, and he said something about it, right? Well, he says he that slipped. he he brought back to life almost. He was dead, and then he stopped because, like, he gave him a look. He like shot him a look, and he's like, "Yeah, don't talk about that. Yeah. They already don't believe us about this other shit. You're gonna say that you think I got I got resurrected, right? Yeah. Like, right? So he's like, no, no. He's because he because he was trying to drive home the point of how much he cares about his people. And he's like, this man like basically went to hell and back essentially. Like he meant to say like he died for his people and he's like yeah. I, I, I mean uh yeah he almost died or something <laughs> you're right but i i like to the line where daenerys turns to Tyrion. she's like you told me you liked this man he refused to bow he's calling me a child like, like what the fuck is this right who is this guy yeah. like, i like that because john keeps making these statements he's like yeah, I, I trusted you like you told me this guy was good he's like i do trust this man <laughs> right he's like but that's what I mean. She's already, she's already losing it here. She's like, fuck, this guy will bend the fucking knee. Who is this guy? <laughs> he showed up at the wrong time of the month. My yeah, friend. apparently. Tyrion says that they cannot split their forces. Davos then speaks up for his liege lord and tells Daenerys that Jon won't won the support of the wildlings and fought the White Walkers. But Jon cuts him off when he tries to mention the true outcome of the mutiny at Castle Black. Davos says that it doesn't matter who bends the knee. As if they don't put aside their 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 uh, differences to focus on the undead, they will all die. But Tyrion doesn't see the point of Jon's refusal to uh, sum, uh, to submit. Mm. When Jon disputes Daenerys's claims to queenship, da uh, Daenerys responds that he is in open rebellion since he has declared himself king in the north. Daenerys then receives a message from Varys. She orders Masande to give Jon and his followers food and lodging. Then gives a series of uh of orders in Dothraki to Quono. When John asks if he is a prisoner, she says not yet. Varys tells her that the Targaryen fleet was ambushed by Euron Greyjoy's Iron Fleet in the Narrow Seas. He informs her that Yar, Greyjoy, Ilaria Sand, and her daughter Tyene Sand were captured. In response to this grim news, Daenerys allows John and Davos to stay until they can reach a proper agreement. She got that news just in time. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the line was he gave his own like life he basically almost said like to his people yeah the davos thing but yeah but yeah yeah he, he had uh uh when she said bend the knee again and he says why am i gonna bend the knee i don't even know you <laughs> right you know yeah and this is the first time we fucking met yeah he hears all about her right, right. so yeah no i know i like that i yeah. like how he kind of was just like no nah, fuck that right <laughs> so um but various various uh, <laughs> So this next scene in the waters of the narrow sea near Dragonstone, Theon Greyjoy is fished aboard by one of the few surviving ships of Yara Greyjoy's fleet. When the Ironborn question him on what happened to Yara, Theon lies and mentions that he tried in vain to save her, leaving them unimpressed. <laughs> one of the men replies that he wouldn't be here if he tried to save her. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. He's just like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, he would have been on the ship. Yeah, he wouldn't have been if right? he tried to save her. If he yeah. didn't jump ship, he would yeah. have been hanging with her. Yeah, no, it's true though, right? So yeah. Anyways, uh, where are we next here? Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, you're on King's Landing. Here yeah. we go. You're on. <laughs> you're on parades. The captives Yara, Alaria, and Tyene through the streets of King's Landing, reveling in his victory all the way to the Red Keep. The crowd pelts. 
Yara, Alaria, and Tyene with rotting fruit. Impressed with his gift, Cersei agrees to an alliance with the Lord Reaper and praises him as a true friend to the crown. Alaria spits at Cersei's feet while Sir Gregor Clegane, the mountain, is present among the Queen's Guard. When Euron demands his reward, which, you know, was banging Cersei, Cersei responds that he will get it once the war is over. Wow, she's waving that out in front of him. It is like, she's good I, at that. It honestly, do you think she's really worth that? <laughs> like, come on. Like, listen, no. she's attractive, but, like, just, like, to wave, like, this guy's got to win a war for her to get that yeah. reward? Like, that's no. a little much, bro. <laughs> like, I know she's a queen, but whoa, cold eh? This guy wants it bad. Yeah, he does. He does want it bad. Jesus. I would. I don't know about that. I don't know if I go to war over her get, getting to, her to sleep with me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, so uh, Cersei appoints Euron as the commander of her naval forces and her brother Jaime as commander of her armies. Despite the fanfare, Jamie is privately hostile towards Euron and tells the Lord Reaper of Pike that his head belongs on a spike. Euron then uh, tells Jamie that he desires Cersei and asks for tips about her sexual tastes. <laughs> much, much, much to Jamie's silent fury, he is fucking giving him a hard fucking time about that on the sidelines. And Jamie is so <laughs> pissed in this. Scene. Yeah, I was laughing. Yeah, bro. it was funny how he's giving him a hard time. Yeah, you know, and he just says, "Does she like the finger in the bum?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wants tips. Man. I just wrote down here. Cersei practically promises her vagine for Euron to help her win the war. Like, what the hell, bro? Like, what is going on? Like, if you were the people in that throne room, you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> I feel like what is happening right now? Like, this is what this queen has to offer yeah. her of herself, like yeah. your body. <laughs> that's how, bro, that's how she's getting shit done. Apparently, yeah. he, he wants it, right? It's she's crazy. a manipulator. She's very good at that. I mean, because she can, it's like she said, she's not that. Uh, impressive yeah uh later cersei confronts alaria and tyene in their cell which where both are gagged and chained to opposite walls accompanied by sir gregor clegane and quyburn cersei remembers oberon martell's showdown with him during Tyrion's second trial by combat sadistically recalling the red viper's savage death to alaria and how alaria screamed at the sight of it she later provokes alaria's sorrow by recalling oberon's fierce S skill with his spear and how that eventually didn't stop Gregor from killing him, as well as inferring that Oberyn brought his death on himself by taunting Gregor instead of just leaving him to die, which she's not wrong. She then remembers raising Marcella and the fact that Alaria murdered her. So a lot of bad blood between these two, obviously, what they've both been through, right? As uh, as mothers, I guess, as well. That like she's trying to like, you know, drive home to her, like, how dare you do that? And I'm glad this happened to you and yeah. my daughter, and I'm gonna kill your daughters, right? So Watch your rut. Yeah, Cersei goes on to praise Tyene's beauty to Alaria and suggesting that she is Alaria's favorite. She contemplates how she will execute Alaria or Tyene, cruelly suggesting Sir Gregor kill them the way he killed Oberyn. However, uh, it would be too fast to death. She kisses Tyene in the, with a long farewell, citing poetic justice for Marcella's murder and torments Alaria by having Quyburn confirm the uncertainty of when the girl will die but also the inevit inevitability of it as the long farewell varies on how long it takes to kill, depending on the strength of its victim's co constitution. Cersei tells Ilaria that she will be left alive to witness the event, as well as to watch her daughter's beautiful face crumble into bone and dust. And that she will, she, that she will be made to contemplate the things she has done, even to the point of being force fed. If she tries to starve herself to death before leaving Cersei orders that, torches be routinely replaced so that hilaria doesn't miss a moment of her death her uh, tyene's death as Alaria frantically struggles against her chains in a futile effort to reach her daughter so yeah she's really torturing the fuck here at her uh, you know rightly so i guess but like she she kissed her with that poison that's going to make her slowly deteriorate right that's yeah, the, whole she's thing, yeah. the other one there to to, the, to watch to watch yeah oh my god brutal and making sure she was fed and, and brutal and bathed and everything. but she get she got what she deserved. She did Got kill her daughter. Across, she yeah. killed her daughter, right? So that anyway. seems fun. Later that evening, Jamie is drinking wine for supper when Cersei arrives and kisses him. <clears throat> uh -oh. He initially is like not into her advances, but ultimately consents to sex. Uh, she goes down on him. She gives her a royal yeah, blowjob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she started getting naked too. Eh? You almost see her naked in this. Listen, if if, if you're if, if there's the guy's not really into it, going down is gonna fucking change his mind. So that's what she got. What's up? She does to him here because he's kind of like, ah, I'm not into this right now. And she, you know, he's like, oh, well, now you're blowing me. What do you want? Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm screwed. 
The next morning, following <clears throat> an incestuous night with Jamie, <laughs> Cersei answers the door for a, a servant who announces that a visitor from Bravos has arrived. And Cersei acknowledges the message and requests fresh sheets. And like Jamie's like, they can't see us like this. She's like, I don't give a fuck. I'm a queen now, right? Yeah. And she's just like, who cares? It's not like they don't fucking know. And right? then, it's true. And then Jamie's like kind of relieved after when like the woman like she's like get get us some fresh seats uh, sheets, sheets. And, and she like opens the door to make sure that like he sees she sees him right he's like he's like ah like in the sheets <laughs> he's like they can't see us like this and she's like fuck it and then jamie's like oh okay i guess right <laughs> no, he's doing it more like this with the one hand right so <laughs> that's right uh all right, what's next here? Cersei meets with Tycho Nestorius, a representative from the Iron Bank of Bravos, uh -oh. who offers his condolences for the loss of her son, Tommen Baratheon. He thanks Cersei for eradicating the faith militant, which he describes as superstition. Cersei realizes that the Iron Bank wants to bet on the strongest faction. Cersei tells him that Lord Euron controls the sea and is an ally for the time being. And then she convinces him uh, to side with the Lannisters by denouncing Daenerys as a revolutionary rather than a monarch. She promises that the Lannisters will pay their debts, unlike the Dothraki and former slaves. Cersei vows to pay the crown's debts in full within a fortnight and invites Nestoris to stay in King's Landing. He is pleased and describes Cersei as her father's daughter. I love how much respect they still got to give to the banks in this show because, like, that's where their money source is. And as we knew previously, the Lannisters are actually in a large amount of debt to the bank right and uh and she says that it's like who, she's broke, but yeah but the banks have to side with like she says like who the most powerful people are it's like you really want to fucking get into business with these guys like these slaves and all and what do these people know about paying back money right just kind of like making that clear right and he's like yes i guess you're uh you're right about that i'd rather deal with you right well but she's and she points out that the uh, since the since uh daenerys has been doing all that the slave trade has gone down right Yes, that's that right. The value, a, yeah, you know, the, the, the slave trade. That's but, right. I mean, I mean, she's basically broke. She got to figure out something, right? Yeah. Well, she says she's getting all this money from somewhere here in this scene. So, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens with that. But maybe it was from the blowjob. Who knows? <laughs> what Jamie's paying her is what you're saying. It comes from the same money. They're for the same family. <laughs> <laughs> Later, John and Tyrion discuss his predicament. John is unhappy that he is a prisoner while the White Walkers and the Night King still pose a threat. Tyrion says he trusts the word of Jor and Mormon and John. John asks Tyrion how he can convince people about the existence of things which they don't believe exist. John wants to help his people and is frustrated with the deadlock. Tyrion encourages John not to give up. When John remarks that he is a fool for going south, Tyrion reassures him that the Mad King's daughter is not her father and has protected people from monsters, telling him to speak with her servants. Tyrion asks if there is something he can do to help John in this scene. Yeah, so that this is good. I, I like them kind of behind the scenes now following up on what just occurred because see, like, Tyrion couldn't really speak like that prior to him meeting Cersei. Excuse and now me. he's kind of like, hey, listen, like, uh, you know, do you, do you need me to do anything? Because now's the time to ask. Like, I'm trying to help you here, bud. Like, he's like, but you need to, you need to believe me as well. And my, uh, my allegiance with this woman, like, I believe in her as, like, as I believe in you, right? Like, so that's like kind of Tyrion's trying to, like, you know, trying to. I like how he just, you know, he's not, uh, you know, they just, he's just cutting loose like a friend here. You know what I mean? This conversation. Yeah, he's just yeah. yeah. After learning about the dragon glass beneath Dragonstone, Tyrion speaks with Daenerys about Jon's request to access the material. Daenerys is preoccupied with the loss of two allies. Uh, Tyrion convinces Danny to let Jon have the dragon glass in order to court his allegiance and tells her to give him something so that they can focus on Casterly Rock. Daenerys listens to her hand's advice but seems more preoccupied with what Davos was about to say about Jon in the throne room, about the reveal that he had died, right? Mm. T Tyrion dismisses it as northern hyperbole, like basically them just talking up the situation, making it seem like John's like coming back from the dead and shit like that, right? So he just thinks it's a bunch of bullshit. Um, I like this scene too. There's a good line here where he says about uh, he says about how you look a lot better look at, you look a lot better brooding than I do, right? <laughs> when he sees him brooding, John, like Tyrion, when he talked to him, yeah, uh, that was pretty fun. I liked that. And uh, also in this scene with uh, Cersei, he, he busts out a wise man once said, he's like, are you trying to present your own statements as ancient wisdom? <laughs> <And he's> like, 
you know, like what she normally does. Like Terry does that a lot. Where he's like, you say it is. Yeah. Cause remember there's other scenes where he's like, who said that? He's like, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh. That was really good. You so. know, but he's, he's, you know what? Hey, he's pretty smart himself. So smart I, guy. Yeah. So I mean, smart guy. it pays off. Yeah. To say those, to say those, because you never when you never know when they'll be right, they'll be true, and he'll be, you know, it'll yeah. be the right word to say. Yeah. Uh, well, Daenerys is watching over her dragons. She is joined by John. Hmm. He tells John that she named her dragons Rhaegal and Viserion after her brothers Rhaegar and Viserys. John realizes that Tyrion has been petitioning her. Daenerys tells John she is determined to remove Cersei. She allows John to mine the dragon glass and agrees to provide men and equipment. Desperate for some validation, he asks her if she believes in the Night King and the White Walkers, and she tells him to get to work. So she doesn't actually believe him still. She's like, Yeah, yeah, just you know, I'm giving you what you want. Now go go do what you have to do. But she kind of dismisses it as like she doesn't believe in. He wants her so bad to believe him, but she's like, Yeah, okay, what which is so fucking weird. She got dragons, and you're gonna tell me you don't believe in this other shit. Like, what the hell is that? Like, come on, like really? Like half the people didn't believe in dragons anymore, but I guess they knew it existed. You know, yeah. they don't have them anymore. Yeah, like it was in the books. Th there was proof. There were skulls. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of shit. But yeah. the White Walkers, I guess there isn't, right? So like you had to live beyond the fucking wall prior to this to like, yeah, right. Or at like, the wall. At the wall. Oh, yeah so you know i just think it's funny how these people believe in some shit but then they're like no that's not possible <laughs> like come on seriously like there's you live in a world full of dragons you yeah. don't believe in this shit so it's called dragon glass for a reason right? dragon stone for a reason. it's weird uh anyways then we go over to winterfell <laughs> sansa and uh peter sansa, sansa and peter baelish <laughs> yeah. they learn from uh master maester wolken that they have about four thousand bushels of wheat Sansa realizes that they don't have enough food for the coming winter. She advocates building granaries to stockpile for a, for a famine. Sansa also orders Jan Royce to see what that the armor made for their armies is outfitted with leather to keep warm. While walking, Baelish and Sansa talk about the threat of Cersei. Peter urges her to fight every battle and to look for threats in every corner. They are then interrupted by a guard who tells Lady Stark that she has received a visitor who turns out to be her younger brother, Bran Stark, accompanied by Mira Reed. She kind of like uh, did. I like the scene because you kind of see her actually thinking like, like as the person in charge here in this scene. Finally, right? Like it, she's kind of like questioning like what they're doing and if they got enough this. And she's like, oh yeah, this about the armor. Like, did you like this scene? I kind of liked how she's kind of she's trying to yeah, yeah, big boss. Yeah, I you know she's that's put her foot down. Yeah, yeah, it's the first time I think we've finally seen her do what she because she's been left in charge for one. She can actually do stuff without people questioning like what she has to say. Right. So I think, it, but I think she's handling it pretty good in this scene that we see her in at least. Right. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, she's learned, she's learned a lot on her way too, and through her, mm -hmm. through her journeys herself. Or if right? not, you know, she's faking it till she makes it right at this point. I mean, right. So a lot either of way, are... you can, you can fool anybody mm -hmm. back then. That's what we seem to know. Following a tearful reunion, the two siblings retreat to the Godswood where Sansa tells Bran how she wishes John were there with them at Winterfell. Mm -hmm. Bran agrees, noting that he needs to speak to John. While Sansa, when Sansa points out that Bran is the rightful lord of Winterfell since he is the last remaining true born son of Ned Stark, he refuses the position, stating that he is the three eyed raven and thus can't be any sort of lord. Sansa begs for Bran to explain what that means. And Bran then demonstrates his newly acquired power to a skeptical Sansa by recalling details from the night of her marriage to Ramsay Bolton. Startled by this, Sansa walks away in shock and tears. Okay, so this is a turning point, everyone. And Jay, you've already, I think, seen the next episode. So I think you can double down on this statement. And I'm not saying anything out of school. This is where fucking Bran gets weird. <laughs> I, I thought, man. I, I mean, he's now he's getting visions and stuff like he's. So he's he's now ascending into his three eyed raven persona. Realm, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like uh, we saw him kind of become the three eyed raven after the last one died, but now he's slowly now not even. He's almost got like no emotion. He's yes. Yes. Emotionless now. yes, 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 and I think we are going to speak more on that at next episode, so leave that till then. Yeah, but he, he absolutely, I think this is when he starts to get really fucking weird. And this is the character, you know, his storyline I never really cared about all so much throughout the series, even upon revisiting this uh, show. I think I still feel the same way about it, mm -hmm. but I think, um, 
obviously he has an important fucking part to play because this three eyed Ravens, a guy that's been, you know, saying all this shit that's about to happen with the white walkers. Like he's a very important key figure. I feel like in everything going on, mm -hmm. but I, I think now like whoever brand was like, this is uh, this is I think the last that you're gonna see of that 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 like he's turning into something else I mean, now, right? Yeah, like, you know, it's kind of cool that they do it like that too because he's grown so much since he's yes. seen him last season, right? So I mean, it's kind of cool. Like, okay, he's gone through puberty now, so then we gotta. <laughs> I, I I remember at the time too, like when this actually aired, this show. I remember this. We were making fun of how ridiculous it was because she's like, it's like, explain this to me. I don't understand what this three eyed Raven stuff is. He's like, oh, it's uh, it's hard to explain. <laughs> like He just says it's difficult to explain. So I'm, I'm just not going to explain it. And like as viewers at the time, I remember being like, yeah, please explain it. Like What the fuck is going on? Like, it must have been something that had you guys like fucking. Oh, it's just, but I got pissed off because he keeps brushing it off. Oh, yeah. Well, it's hard to explain, really. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, clearly, if the show is not giving us the opportunity, giving like explaining it for you, then it's kind of weird. This whole storyline, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. It's just I, maybe I, it's a storyline that was never I, finished. I, I just love like he doesn't he doesn't move, and he's like, like you said, he's like on another planet now. Like he's just like spaced out. Yeah, <laughs> he just stares at things, and <laughs> I, and like it just. It just sucks because she's so excited to see him because she literally hasn't seen this guy in five fucking seasons yeah. and they're they're reunited and it's just like it's just an empty shell you yeah. know what i mean like of who her brother was now yeah. because of the three-eyed raven shit i just it just sucks i don't know i, I kind of like if i was in his position i would kind of be like why am i the guy who had to be destined to be this dude you know what i mean like i mean like uh, you know he thinks he's all knowing and everything else so yeah sure i guess he's powerful but like you know what? Is, day, he's yeah. a cripple, like, and he has to sit there now he's for eternity, shit. right? Like, what the fuck? It's weird. Anyways, <laughs> I just like how you brushed over that, though. He's just like, oh, it's hard to explain. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I think he does it in the next episode too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anyways, at the Citadel, Archmaester Ebros examines Jorah Mormont's wounds and uh, you know says that the infection is no longer active like just like that he yeah. just looked at it bro and he's like all right perfect e ebros realizes that somebody treated Jora, but mormon mormon claims the belief that rest and the climate healed him <laughs> overnight. Yeah, that's what it was overnight <laughs> I love that. He's like, yeah, I, I don't know, the air here. And uh, for somebody I, who's so smart, he plays so stupid I, very well. I got a lot of rest. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what to tell you, Doc. <laughs> no. I love that. He's like, yeah, well. thanks. Uh, <laughs> Ebros uh, e lets Jorah go, but orders a private uh, meeting with Sam <laughs> later that evening. It's obvious to Jorah and Sam that he's in trouble. But Sam says he'll find out by just how much in the evening. Jorah tells Sam that he's returning to Daenerys because she gave him hope Why? and a sense of purpose. Remember, that she said that. She's like, you go out there and you 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 you, you heal yourself. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, you must leave now because I can't trust you. But you come back to me healed. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything for you. <laughs> Oh my remember God. that remember that where yeah, she's just yeah, like yeah. she's fucking the most selfish thing in the world but that's say. what i mean in my head i still think that You're like uh, why bro you have a new lease of life don't yeah. go back there. <laughs> he Find loves her though bro he's in love with her though i get it he's in love with her now he's like i can probably bang her that i'm not diseased anymore <laughs> finally yeah, yeah eh? oh. oh boy <laughs> <laughs> all right Jorah, th Jorah thanks him for saving him, and he says, Jorah thanks Sam for saving him, and Sam says it's the least he could do given everything that Jorah Mormont did for him. Jorah is clearly moved when he takes Sam offered farewell handshake, which was a really fucking sick moment, though, where he's like, he's like, oh, you're not afraid of me? He's like, oh, you, you, yeah, that's right, you healed me. He's like, thank you. Like, you know, right? like, because he, because he, he, extend, yeah. he extends the head, right? And like, up to this point, he's like, I can't touch anybody. Like, right? He's just like, oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Like, he, it was a nice moment. I was like, oh, man, I love Zora. I, I think he's a great character. I just didn't like, like that he was going to be leaving. Uh, yeah. We'll see. We'll see how that pans out. Uh, having expected to never touch another person ever again. Yeah, <laughs> I just, I just started. Uh... Go feel up to <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. Um, I, I like how he said that too. His parting words was like, "Perhaps our uh, paths will cross again." Like, right? He's just like, "Yeah, thank you so much for this." Right? Perhaps our paths will cross again. Right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, so happy to shake his hand. You know, I, I like that. It was a nice moment. Anyways, in private, Ebros, uh, you know, gives Sam shit for embarking on an illegal healing procedure due to the high risk of infection. Nevertheless, he praises Sam for his success, noting that it was an extraordinarily difficult operation and asks for the secret of his success. Sam replies that he simply read the books and followed the instructions. Ebros congratulates Sam by telling him to make fresh copies of several old manuscripts and scrolls. Uh, so their knowledge can be preserved, explaining that Sam's reward is not being expelled from the Citadel because he's like, really, I still got to do that shit. Yeah. I just I just fucking healed this guy. Right. And he's yeah. just like, listen, you're lucky you're on thin ice. Now. You're on he's thin like, ice. you're lucky. I'm not fucking kicking you out of here. He's like, if you didn't basically he said to him, if you didn't fucking uh, heal this guy, you would have been gone. Like, right. He's like, you're you. It was a bold move. Well, you know, they, it's good, too, because now they want to know his knowledge. They that's right. Know that he's worth being there. That's right. That's right. He earned his uh, his fucking his stay there. Too. Essentially, yeah. Even though he has to do the shits and clean the shits yeah. and the food and all that. I just stuff. like how he's just like, How did you do this? Yeah. He's like, I don't know, I just follow the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> like he's like, you know, microwaving a microwave dinner or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just follow the instructions on the box. Right? That's it. He was good at it, man. He, did he was he did. good, yeah. Uh in the chamber of a painted table, Daenerys confers with her advisors, which is a big famous table when you get to House of the Dragon, right? Like that's uh that's yeah, that's a big uh, that's their fucking throne room, right? That's like a uh, nice bat- one. yeah. Uh not throne room, like place where they talk about like battles and shit. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bat- like um war room. Yeah. yeah. Other than the dragon on the side and all that. Danny confers with her advisors, Tyrion, Varys, and Masande. Uh Daenerys proposes going out with her dragons to hunt Euron Greyjoy's Iron Fleet. But Masande and Tyrion argue against it. They have no idea where Euron is, and it, all it would take is for one stray arrow to kill Daenerys, and the dragons would be uncontro- uncontrollable. Tyrion thinks that the Lannisters will put up a fierce fight for Casterly Rock. Tyrion tells her that the gates and walls of Casterly Rock are impregnable to siege. However, his father Tywin assigned, this is when he is very useful, Tyrion, to build the sewers in his youth. Tyrion tells him that he built Smart. a secret tunnel through a cove to bring in his prostitutes. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. no, remember that? That's, That's right. We, we see it right That's in the right. beginning. In the, so Tyrion uh, remarked, Tyrion's remarks are uh, basically um, like as he's describing this, they're, they're cutting in scenes like of like the, the hole in the wall and everything else. Like we're seeing his viewers uh, as he's describing what he did and his part in everything like he used to do back home. Yeah, they're a little jumping back and forth. Yeah, and it's kind of convenient because he's like, like only you can only fucking fucking fit like a person like in this one spot through the wall, essentially, right? Like it's pretty interesting. Um, and he talks about like uh, you know, they talk about they show the unsullied trying to storm the fortress in this uh in this scene yeah i mean it's, it's a huge advantage having terry in there who you know who knows all this shit right house, about yeah. the sewers and everything else. but he also said that people are gonna die right yes in the westerlands gray worm and the unsullied lay siege to the lannister seat of casterly rock but face fierce resistance at the gates and walls the unsullied managed to sneak in through Tyrion's secret cove tunnel Following fierce fighting, Grey Worm managed to overwhelm the garrison and capture the castle. Grey Worm quickly realizes that the Lannisters have only installed a skeletal garrison. Overlooking the battlements, Grey Worm questions a wounded Lannister soldier about where the main Lannister forces are and realizes that they have stumbled into a trap. Euron's Iron Fleet sneaks up on the Unsullied fleet from behind and unleashes projectiles, setting many Targaryen ship ablaze. Yeah, so, I mean, like, they went there expecting one thing and they were greeted with the next. So yeah, yeah. Tyrion kind of fucked up here a little bit. Eh. Not really. I mean, they still overtook it in a way, but he, he, they weren't, they obviously were expecting them to hit Casterly rock. Right. So I guess they kind of had, they just went up them. Right. Mm. So meanwhile, in the reach farther South, Jamie Lannister, Randall, Tarly and Braun lead the Lannister and rebel forces towards high garden. Olena Tyrell looks out from a balcony and sees the impending army approaching the castle. The battle is swift slaughtering the Tyrell soldiers in high garden. Jamie finds Olena sitting alone in her study. Uh, he confirms that the battle is over as Olena admits that the Tyrell army wasn't known for their prowess. And she confirms, she informs Jamie that, Tyrion and Daenerys plan to invade Casterly Rock and thought the main Lannister force would be defending it. Jaime, while pouring two glasses of wine, reveals that it was a setup, explaining that his ancestral home is now practically worthless, aside from childhood sentiment. Uh-huh. A token garrison was left behind, and the rock stores were emptied before they fled. 
as they're both kind of revealing their plans with one another here, right? Yeah. yeah. He also states Euron's Iron Fleet will destroy the attacking fleet, leaving the Unsullied trapped deep in Westeros at the mercy of Lannister forces. Meanwhile, the main Lannister army would be far away from the main attack, a strategic move Jamie learned from Rob Stark's attack at the Whispering Wood. I know, he brought him up. He's like, hey, I learned that from him. That was, that was pretty good. Yeah, he was impressed by that, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Olena wonders why Tywin Lannister didn't just take Highgarden when Casterly Rock's mines first ran out of gold. Knowing her end is near, she remarks that she may ask Tywin himself soon enough. What do you think about the lead up to this scene, Jay? Did you like this? Yeah, or it was what? interesting. And then, yeah. and then it was like, what's going to happen here? I just think it was a good opportunity for these two characters to talk like honestly to one another, sure, right? She just said Jeffrey was a cunt. Yeah. Like, he really was a cunt. I think she <laughs> threw that in there at one point. Yeah, I, I have that written down here. She's like, uh, she asked him about like, what what was that sword? What did he call that again? And he's like, the widow's whale. He's like, he really was a cunt, wasn't he? Because <laughs> she, sure she sees the sword, the, uh, the Valerian seal. Yeah. That's another thing too. Now with the, it's been revealed, the Valerian seal and the dragon glass and all that shit are good against the White Walkers. Everyone's Valerian steel swords are being brought into play now, yeah. right? Everyone's They're like, everywhere. oh, is that Valerian steel? Yeah, it is. Like, you know, everyone's like, oh, Valerian steel, right? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's the new Rolex. It is. Yeah, take note of who has Valerian steel because it's going to be very important moving forward, guys. <laughs> uh, um. I like this scene too because she warns him yeah. of his sister's cruelness in this scene. I love, I love that she said that. She's like, it really kind of makes Jamie second guess about the whole situation. I feel like in this scene, right? Because like she warns him, she's like, listen, all I'm gonna say is that your sister is fucking cruel. Like she's the cruelest fucking human being essentially that I've ever met. And like, you shouldn't be fucking doing her bidding. Like she basically says to him, like, I don't know about this whole situation, yeah, poor fool. right? Olena asks Jamie how he intends to kill her, speculating he will kill her with Widow's Whale, <laughs> Joffrey Baratheon's old sword. Remar remarking on Joffrey's horrible nature, Olena proudly admits that she enacted measures to protect her family at all costs with no regrets, but she reflects that her actions pale in comparison to the atrocities performed by Cersei. She tells Jamie that Cersei is a monster, a matter of opinion, according to Jamie. Mm -hmm. He kind of brushes it off, right? Mm -hmm. While some may dread her, Jamie insists that none will care what she has done so long as order is restored. She is a Cersei's a disease. Olena observes that Jamie really does love his sister and calls him a fool, claiming that she will be the end of him, and that by the time he realizes what a disease Cersei is, mm -hmm. it'll be far too late for him. Jamie considers this a moot point of little value discussing with Olena, although she points out that as an experienced person about to die, she is the perfect person to discuss his life with. Yeah. Because he can say whatever the fuck he wants to her in this moment. It's very true, right? That's what I mean. Like, I liked how they kind of were able to share this moment with one yeah. another. Olena again asks Jamie how he plans to kill her. Jamie tells her of Cersei's idea of having her whipped and beheaded or flayed alive and hanged, but he talked her out so of those ideas. Yeah. He then produces a small vial and empties his contents into one of the glasses of wine, giving it to Olena, who then drinks it after Jamie confirms that it will be a painless death. Yeah. Olena reflects on the horrible way that Joffrey died and the gruesome details that the poison caused. She admits that part was unintentional on her part as she has never seen the Strangler work in person before. Shocked into silence, Jamie stares at her, realizing at last who really killed his eldest son. It's true, this is the first time he, it was revealed, and mm -hmm. let his brother take the blame, which also kind of reinforces his love for it's Tyrion like, yeah, as well in this weird. moment, right? Setting in motion the deaths of Oberyn Martell and Tywin Lannister. Satisfied at his horror, Olena insists that he tells Cersei that she was the one who murdered her son. A final cutting barb from the Queen of Thorns. He's stuck it there, yeah. He's like, you know, just... Tell her, just tell her, tell her it was me. The fucking cut. Yeah. I mean, we kind of figured that out, right? But a fitting end yeah. to the episode. I felt like this scene and, and to this character. She chugged back that fucking wine. I like this episode. I, I I like this episode. The last ten minutes of this episode, honestly, in my opinion, are Game of Thrones perfection. Like this is this is. This is the scenes I feel that like we've been lacking with all these setup episodes that we've been having this season so far. Like, that's what I mean. Like, this was a perfectly done scene between two characters. Exactly. Because it was, yeah. you, know, you had good two act, two good characters that are yes. acting and they both want, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you still see Jamie as 
kind of a nice guy because he chose to do it the other way. Right? I'm glad he, he said that because I, I I know Jamie after all this shit. Yeah, Jamie, he's just on the wrong team. Bro. I I've told you this before, and I told you this. I barely. <laughs> No, but I've told you that I made this comment and it's, it's been a while since I probably said this on the show. I said this to you, I think early on when we first started this show. Okay. And I said to you at that time, I'm like, Jamie's character arc yeah. in the whole show is one of my favorite character arcs. That, yeah. yeah it, I said, I just, because I'm like, he's such a piece of shit at the start. And then like over time, I, I learned to really like this character yeah. a lot. And I mean, we still have a ways to go, so that, you know we'll see how that changes towards the end. But I just think from like one point to the his start point to the end point of this character, I think is is uh, uh, like on the show, like first season, the eighth season or whatever, like uh, last season, I, I think is is just really fucking good. Like one of the best in the show, in my opinion, just because I, I he goes through a lot. This guy on this show, like yes, he was a fucking piece of shit who fucks his sister at the start of the show. But like then you learn like all the shit that really like he had to deal with in it. Like you know what I mean? Like the perception of the, him as a person yeah. and his he family. Took a, lot of a blow too from it. Yes, right from yeah. what his family does. Yeah, uh, exactly. I just think he took it. It's interesting because he just took it differently than Tyrion did. Like they both kind of dealt with their like shit in their lives as being a result of this family. Yeah. But he just took it. He had other opportunities given to him as a result of being not a dwarf that Tyrion did not. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so like, I just think it's if it was the other way around, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's why I always like those two relationship with one another too. those two. Right. The brothers. Right. So yeah. anyways, that was. Good episode. Good yeah, episode. Really and Olena good. went out like a G, as she should, she honestly. Had, yeah. So one of the know, best characters. It just sucks that that's the way. I mean, she had to die, obviously. Yeah. But. Yeah. So so there you go, guys. There's another episode in the books here. As always, you can catch us back here on Thursdays. At these episodes air live at 8 p.m. on Thursdays on the Late, at, uh, on the late Night Chat Network. And uh, make sure, sure to check out our playlist. All kinds of great shows here on our channel. Or oh. you can check in with Jay and our other guest hosts, uh, our other hosts, uh, here on Late Night Chat Network on the Late Night Chat Show. That's uh, bi-weekly now. Comes out every two weeks, but uh, live. And if you guys don't catch it live, we have a show that comes out every week now. Uh, they, they basically, you get every every co-host and Jay on for two weeks in a row and until the next one, right? So it's it's a, it's been a really good setup now. I feel like the transition over to that uh, five years into this thing, right? So it's been interesting. It's been a, an interesting journey, just like Game of Thrones, Jay, the late night chat. <laughs> so anyways, next episode, guys, is going to be uh, episode four of season seven of Game of Thrones, which is called The Spoils of War. And uh, it's a another fucking doozy of an episode. Honestly, a lot of things happen that next episode. So make sure to tune in for that one. That'll be a good one as uh, we, we uh, you know, we see the end of this season coming soon. So yes, we do. All right, Jay. Thanks again. And uh, we'll see everyone next time. We'll see everybody soon.